Because then the first one could be just like really shitty. So there's like yeah, room to grow. To work. Yeah. All right. This is my first attempt at a podcast. It was recorded yesterday at a brunch place. Uh, sitting with me was Mike St. John and Doug Colo. Doug is a good buddy of mine, and Mike St. John is a good buddy of mine. Mike also plays keyboards and lights and stage visuals for the Devin Townsend Project and Steve Vai and a bunch of whatever else. I don't know. Uh, it's shitty quality, but whatever. Um, if the first one's shitty, then, you know, it's only a lot more room to grow, right? Uh, yeah, I'll probably say more at the end of this hour here. Have you ever been, have you ever done one? A podcast? Yeah. I don't know really. what Jamie did in that room, what Jamie would, did you see that? Who's Jamie even? Uh, Jamie Jasta and Devin, they did it in that yeah. room and, and he just had a laptop. I don't remember him having mics or anything, but it sounded fine. Some guys just bring a Zoom and that's it. Uh, well, didn't Dev do the one with Jericho the other day too? Yeah, I don't know what they did. Probably just sat around, was a, a, in the room. Sat around a Zoom H5. Yeah, because Jericho. <laughs> You might have to speak up, I think, because I can even barely hear you. <laughs> was it authentic, or did he do the acting uh, On the podcast that I listened to with them, he was like, just a guy, and then when he came and did the on-camera stuff, he kind of turned it on. Turned it on a bit, yeah. Yeah, he was all over the place, eh? Yeah. When do you leave again? Thursday. Four days. Just having some emails here with Mr. Bai about life. Good time. Is that the new... That's the... Hey, man. Hey. I'm not sure that we are. Are you ready to order? Oh, are you ready to order? Uh... Are you ready? You're ready? Yeah, sure. You go first. I do your basic with avocado, cream, your eggs, and toast is okay with you? Yeah. Organic quinoa bowl, please. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. oh there's more in the back. Yeah, I think that'll be probably the best. Oh, there's the Benny. Thank you. What's this? Is there a special Benny yes, today? No, it's no Benny today. It's a Brazilian bowl. Oh, okay. It's with pinto beans, rice, cilantro, and jack, Monterrey jack cheese. Yes? Queso. Okay, so exactly. Yeah. And poached eggs with tomato sauce. Sausage or mushroom? Is that better than the quinoa bowl? I'm going to do that. I tried the vegetarian and the vegetarian. It was very, very good. Do so you think the special is better than the quinoa bowl? Yeah. That's the quinoa bowl. You never, you never have this I've never been here ever. Oh, my God. So... I'm leaving in your hands, man. Usually, it's, if you're at first time, it's usually the Benny. I know, but I've had Benny's up the wazoo. Yeah, but you've never had Benny's here. Should I get Benny's now? <laughs> I don't know. Are you <laughs> yeah, I'd like to be. I mean, if we can. So much. I don't love mushrooms. Oh, dude, you with the Benny's. Much? I also don't really want the veggie like, bacon because that's just super no, processed. No, 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 no. You know? Yeah. Beans, avocado. Avocado. I don't really love mushrooms. Yeah. Okay. Beans, avocado, avocado. 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 Good with the quinoa bowl, though, man. Yeah, whatever. I'll do the special. Okay, sausage or mushroom? Sausage. Sausage. Okay. Yeah. I think that what he's, it sounds like that thing that you ordered at that weird French place we went to. Oh, no, no. It's still a quinoa bowl, isn't it? Or is it with rice? I don't know. 
That place is good. I can't remember what it's called. Some French place. But it was like eggs in like a soup almost type of thing. Well, Huevo Ranchero is often is like kind of soupy. But like, like a soup soup? Or just it was like, like, like a sauce. creamy, like a creamy mushroom soup. Yeah. Almost, but like really heavy. Like melted cheese. Yeah. Uh, with yeah. like a couple fried eggs on it. Tastes pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> So that Vi thing is a is that a G three or something like those guitar? Uh, it's, it's G five, I guess. Generation X is uh, Tosin Nabasi from Animals Leaders. You know Bettencourt from Accept. No, Extreme. Nino from Extreme. Yeah, Nuno even. And uh, Nuno. Uh, More than words. That's the one, yeah. <laughs> uh, their breakthrough. Uh, who else? Zach, Zach Wild from that stuff that he does. Sabbath and all that, right? You're, I don't even know. Uh, Ingbe and Almstein, greatest guitar player who ever lived. Do we have to uh, live on a bus with Zach? Well, there's going to be no buses because it's like every day we fly somewhere else. Oh, oh. Sadly, I have to be in a hotel every day. A single tier. Well, you get to hang out with Zach rad. a little bit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I get to light them and put them in the dark and stroll them. And... I don't know how much we'll actually hang out, but not very much. No, I mean, I guess I'll see them for three hours every day, but they won't see me. Yeah, you're just some guy. Some show at the light desk. Didn't I'm... you do it before? No. No, they just did the American tour, and the lighting guy is not doing this tour, so I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that means for him or for me or what I should expect. It should be great. A lot of You're great the Vi guy now. Yeah, I got in on Vi's coattails or whatever, so it should be all right. Apparently, I'm happy. Yeah. And I've never been to any of these places. So many places. You've been to Japan? I've been to Tokyo, but I haven't been to Nagoya or Osaka. I haven't been to Jakarta. I haven't been to Taipei. I haven't been to Seoul. I haven't been to Hong Kong. I haven't been to Jakarta. Shanghai. You're going to South of Africa? Indonesia, Indonesia even? Yeah. Jakarta. Indonesia? Oh. But, uh, I'm thinking like Johannesburg. Yeah. I'm going Johannesburg. But Tesseract's <laughs> going to Johannesburg in Cape Town. Wow. And they said that they're, the thing that sold them on it is that the promoter's going to do like a safari tour for them. Oh. Like how awesome would that be? Go play a couple shows and they go on safari. So they were like on the fence about playing and then the guy was like, hey, free safari. Yeah. They're like, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay we'll go. I would go for a safari. But you so. said it in such a way that they were like, even like, well, I don't yeah, know they if were we should. completely sold on it, yeah. Apparently. I mean. Or they were think maybe not sold until. It's just like it's a long way to go for two shows, I guess, yeah. right? Like it's a lot of not playing to play two shows, I guess. Well, if they're making like, if it, they're coming out on the plus. Yeah, I mean, that might, but maybe they're, I don't know, right? Because yeah. usually, like, breaking a market for the first time, who knows how it's going to sell. Blah, blah, blah. Well, your guarantees are higher. Probably. I didn't know Tesseract was that big. Pardon me? I had no idea Tesseract was that big. Yeah. All these, like, uh, prog gent guys are branching out into all these territories. So I think it takes one band to go somewhere and then all the other bands are like oh okay we'll try that out right okay. like India and then uh, South Africa yeah. like Periphery re recently in South Africa maybe okay. I know Protest the Hero was recently in South Africa yeah. quite recently I mean like in the last two years or something yeah I'd love to go man we're a little like so hesitant to do things I don't know if it's everyone's old or what but we almost went to India and then we didn't go and then we're talking about maybe going to Dubai but but everyone's like, amazing. yeah, I'd love to go back there, man. Yeah, Dubai's cool. There's that big festival in Dubai, I think. It's a big rock festival. Yeah. That place is crazy, man. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, Dubai's strange. The structures are absolutely amazing. Yeah, well, they've got just all the money, right? They can build yeah. whatever they want, and they do, and they do it. I think they're aware that the oil money's not going to last forever, so they're trying to build a tourist. It's like Disneyland for adults without oh, yeah. any theme parks, right? It's just like the whole tour you go is crazy, like larger than life, everything, yeah. 
Um, and then repressed locals. But then, yeah, but then you can't, you know, you can only drink in, you can't drink in the street, you need, I don't know, hangs, I don't know. You can't, like, what I think is really interesting is uh, men are very comfortable, uh, like, friends will hold hands. Yeah. Just like two men, like 40-year-old dudes walking down the street holding hands. Yeah. But if you kiss that guy, you get like killed, yeah. right? So it's or or whatever. If you're homosexual, you're just whatever. What about the Italian kids on the cheek, though? Yeah, I know. That's why I, I want to change my example. I don't know how how the how the Italian uh, UAE kiss goes, but it's like it's all right to hold hands, which is something that you would never see in Canada. Like two heterosexual men like just holding hands because they want to, or they'll like just lock pinkies and they'll lock like pinkies lock. I even hate doing that with girls. I don't know how. I, it's exactly. uncomfortable. Like if we like just if we just walk down the street holding hands. Yeah. I feel like we need it's to be like, uh, it's, skipping. Oh, it's hard. Oh, yeah. It's like a ninja just came out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, yeah, but then there it's like everyone holds hands, but if you're you know, caught in a bedroom with a guy, then they'll kill you or whatever. But it's like it's just hard to walk that way. Apparently not in the UAE. They love walking that way. It's kind of weird though how it can be that way in some parts where, you know, just because two guys or two women or whatever, they like one another and it makes other, the masses uncomfortable. It's like, you can't do that or, you know, to death. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's intense. Man. It's all it is, really. It's, it's... Oh yeah, it's just, well, it's silly, right? Yeah. Oh, it is. Totally silly. It's like, we just edit all of this silence out. We're drinking coffee at the round now, which is noisy. I don't think I'm gonna. You gotta use it. Because there was one I did at a, or I heard at a coffee shop. Yeah. They were at a, a coffee shop in Sweden or something. There's just two dudes. <clears throat> it sounded pretty good, but I don't know what they were doing. Was it as loud as it was Didn't sound like it. So you could, whenever you do just like two guys and you go to a coffee shop, you could just get like a single serving that you both share and your podcast could be called Two Dudes, One Cup. <laughs> yeah. What should it be called? Uh, three Anybody? Dudes, Three Cups? I don't know. Zen. It should just be called Zen. People will wonder if it's an acronym for something. Zim says stuff. Breakfast with Zim. Breakfast with Zim. I like just no. the Zim podcast. It's simple. Zimcast. Zim Pod, says Pod things. Zim. Or Zim says things. Dot com. <laughs> Should see if any of these are available. As uh, Zim talks to people. Things, things to buy. Why? Go to the bathroom before this food arrives. Yeah. Leave you awkwardly. Uh, that's okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Have you been to the one down here? There's like uh, I think there's from Nanaimo, which is Nanaimo's up there maybe. Oh, um, it's like revolver where everything's pour over and stuff. Yeah, we did that uh, last weekend. Yeah, but there, but there's like a place right up down on the, on the block. Only you can see and it's it. really good. It's like five dollar just normal black coffee, but it's like oh. pretty good. It'll be the bomb for five bucks or very Well, what price. did we pay? We paid like five, it was like four bucks or something. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, we did. It was pretty good too, though. But it's just like manual brewing. Because he's an like actual guy, he's not putting the, labor. Yeah. So you're paying for the. I, it does taste better. I like the taste of it. Yeah. It definitely does. But I don't find it any different. I'll go to JG Bean and get the, the French press. Yep. And it tastes just as good. Yeah. It's like the four of them. Yeah. I think it's really the same thing, though. That's what someone had told me. And I, I I'd asked them, what's the difference? No difference? And they're like, oh, this is just like you have a bit more control over the brewing process over the pour over. Okay. And then in the French press, it's just, it's still clean, but it's, the differences are so mild. 
I thought it was really the same thing. It's just because you let it sit and then you like slowly push it through. Yeah. But the other thing is you have it in the cylinder filter and then you just pour it in that weird circle fashion so it gets to all the ground and then just slowly leaks. Eventually it still goes through the same kind of screen. Yeah. And you can only get one cup out of a quarrel. Oh, yeah. Or unless they were they were putting it at, at Revolver, they were putting it into like these weird mason jars. And you take that to your table. That's right. And then you pour it into a little cup. That's right. Yeah. <coughs> I don't know how well it's going. I guess it might it might do pretty good. It just seems Wait. like the whole pour over thing. I saw like Starbucks does that now. We're talking the pour over versus the French press. Ah, uh, pour over so good, but it's not that much. It doesn't taste that much different as a press. What am I even sitting on right now? Uh, I don't know. I'd have to I'd have to do a side by side. Like if you had the JJ Bean press. Uh, no, I haven't. That's all you're getting. It's, it's like two fifty. So. I just get the two bucks. Two fifty there, and yeah. it's like it's an delicious. Panel. Yeah, and it tastes just like a pour over, like it's that clean sort of. Well, they probably have a really good uh, press. Like, I find that my French press leaks the granules. Shit, yeah. So does mine. So that yeah. whoever gets the bottom cup gets God, some of the worst. Yeah. You get the mud. <laughs> yeah, and also I let it sit forever too, so it. It just gets like super bitter and overly yeah. tasteful. Uh, we were at. I've been uh, going early. But I've been pushing it early. No, my press. How early? Like four minutes. That's the perfect time. Four minutes. Yeah, I usually go. I used to go longer. Oh, I used to let it sit for like half an hour. And yeah. I wondered why it tasted like garbage. It's cold and tastes like this. <laughs> yeah. Just nasty. Yeah. Yeah. I, I won't even, my first cup, I won't even pour it up all the way. And I'll just put cold water in it just to top it off. Oh, yeah. So I can start drinking like right there. Yeah. Right? But then you're getting watery coffee. Yeah, diluted coffee. Yeah, it's not going to taste good. Oh, I didn't think about that. I'm sure it's alright. Your body just wants the caffeine. It tastes okay. When Dave and I were in um, Helsinki, we went to a, a cafe, like a roastery there. And the guy, we had the same uh, brew, the exact same bean, but one was in a siphon and one was in a pour over and you can really taste the difference it's really interesting what's the siphon the siphon is where uh they basically use they're using heat like they light a little bunsen burner under a thing of water and at some point it somehow pulls pulls the water through the grinds oh into like yeah it's like a thing. stove top thing yeah right? it's kind of like yeah but it's because of the, I guess it gets heated up and the air pressure like pulls the water through. Off the percolator. Top. Isn't it a percolator? It's not a percolator. Yeah. Percolator is just water falling through. But this is like pulling it somehow through. The thing that I used to do, yeah, it was like a metal jar. Yeah. And on the top had this little cup thing where your grounds at the top. Yeah. Uh, and I don't remember where I put the water though. I will find a picture for you. Yeah, it was in the bottom. It's like it, and it boils. It boils, it comes up through the grounds. I yeah. Think. Into the, Back into the water? Uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, no, no. Well, there's the ones that you put on the stove. Yeah. And the, the grounds are at the top. It must fall back in the middle. Yeah, I, I don't know how that works now either. I really do not know how that works. We know things. But it is a mesh bottom too, so. Yeah, it's so true. If the water's here. Here, here's the siphon. Well, maybe it goes through the spout the over the top of the ground. Trying to figure out where the coffee ends up going. That's you the siphon? You get to the bottom the of the here. And I think oh, it the water like starts down here. No, he's pouring it, isn't this, it? This is the pour over. Yeah. This is the siphon. Oh. I think the water starts down here. 
goes up into that somehow. That is oh, yeah. Traction. Look at that thing. Which one was better? Well, the I'm trying to remember which one was which now, but I think the I think the siphon had a more direct and like clean taste, and the pour over had more like more of a mouthful, yeah, like more full body kind of a thing. And then in uh, this is a lot of weird science. It's like chemistry, oh, so coffee gentle, chemistry. Man. I think more than anything is when you get someone who makes coffee that way. They're gonna they're, they're gonna know what they're doing and it's gonna taste like yeah. coffee. Like the best of coffee just, you've ever had. Yeah, just instead of like some kind of garbage, right? Where it's just where it's just like been sitting in a percolator for hours and it's or it's like Tim Hortons or, yeah. or like a Starbucks pour over. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. But <laughs> even I find uh, like Americano, the espresso is so like intense. I guess really dense and intense. And you just don't really get. It's different taste obviously but you don't get that like floral or like nice kind of yeah like flavor out of it that you do with a pour over you can't tell the, yeah you can't get all the flavors in Doug and I went to see this uh, <coughs> live podcast at the Commodore yeah and the two guys went to Revolver Oh, yeah. for coffee and they're, they're talking about it and the one guy was like an ex-UFC fighter I think it was him that said it's like you know the coffee is good when you see the people making it and you know you can beat them up yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting but if he's an ex-UFC fighter can't he beat everyone that's up that's true <laughs> maybe it was yeah maybe it was Brian I think it was yeah. 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 So that, yeah. it's like can I take these if stuff goes down can I take these people <laughs> and if the answer is yes, you know the coffee's gonna coffee, be good. They spend more time on coffee than and grooming their beards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on their choice of uh, flannel for the day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then, yeah, we went into Revolver, and, yeah. and we're like, oh, yeah. That's, oh, yeah. Exa- that's exactly <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah the, uh, the culture, coffee culture is pretty intense sometimes, I think. Pretty right. So at the, at the live podcast, did they include the audience? Yeah, there was a QA. and a Well, no, even during it, they were like... Yeah, it was it was a weird thing. It was more of like a variety show. They did some like improv, improv acting things. And, yeah, right. Yeah, it wasn't very good. Uh, no, were they from here? Were they local guys? No, oh, California. So they tour doing podcasts. They they did it like a west west coast. And you do they charge for the admission? Yeah, oh, that's really interesting actually. I don't think that they put it out though. I don't, I don't think so either. No. That episode didn't get released. No, I don't. it was just bad or what? I, no, I think they just do it as like a hey everybody, you listen to us, so we're gonna bring it this to you. Yeah, I think it's a way to right. get people to more to want to check out their podcast. Yeah. You know, you right. They go on tour, they do the thing, and people are like, hey, let's check the podcast out. I like parts of this kind of. Yeah. I would also think that their podcast that they release is edited and they put a lot of time into making it like as interesting as possible. Yeah, theirs is pretty. And the reason they don't uh, release the live ones is because they're not very good. Yeah. I don't like them as much, the live ones. Even like Star Talk, I listen to and Whenever they do it live, I'm like, yeah. Yeah, you run out of things to talk about. Well, that's the thing, you can edit out all the silence in a podcast. Yeah. yeah. But the, the live ones, I just don't like the audience oh right it's a different thing when you're listening to it it's just people in the room and you feel like you're more there and engaged and listen in the in the conversation but if it's live they're like projecting to an audience so it's like a different level of yeah yeah they're almost performing yeah Yeah. that'd be interesting to do one where you you consciously don't do that, right? You just like forget that the audience is there and yeah. chat. Yeah. Well, the audience might not like that. Then, uh, no. <laughs> hard to say. Yeah. What did you guys think of Author and Punisher? 
That was really good. Yeah. I was hoping to see uh, more of a, all of the spear. More yeah. Of all of it, but uh, most yeah. of it, I guess. <laughs> I felt it was a little uh, one-dimensional, but I wonder if that's because he was lacking the gear, right? Yeah. yeah. But it was it was really cool to see, I thought. And man, did he get into it, too. Man. Yeah. It's I think that was different. With the yeah. lack of gear, He it seemed like he was getting more into it. Yeah, maybe. Because he is like... One, he was upset that stuff wasn't working. Right. I wonder what would would be not working. Though. I don't know. A couple wires come loose and your whole show's gone to shit. Unless it got wet. Maybe all of his stuff got wet. Maybe. Because there was a lot of things that wasn't there. Yeah, really, hey? That kind of sucks. Like, he usually doubles up on the, the keyboards and the laptop. Oh. And he's got this other machine with, like, levers. Yeah. Like, I don't know. It's almost like an airplane control system looking thing. And he's got this oh, other yeah. thing with dials. Yeah. So he looks, and then uh, the Did you see him when he opened thing, Yeah, know? did you see him when he opened for Weed Eater? No. I, I don't think cuz I think he stopped bringing the like it's this big cylinder. It's like 300 pounds of solid metal and he spins it like uh yeah, he doesn't scratch it like a DJ, but it just spins and, and modulates the sound somehow. Crazy. I think it pitches. Somebody told me that it's a pitch shifter. Okay. So he'll slow it down, and then he'll like speed it up, and it just kind of perpetually goes. Because you know, it's so heavy or something. I don't know. So he's missing like his he's entire a, he's show, a, man. Yeah, pretty yeah. much, yeah. 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 Like crazy. when he was setting up, when he got up there, I was waiting for more equipment to come out. Yeah. It's uh, really bad. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And people have like, one cent, that's it. Yeah. You'll have to come back. Yeah. Oh, he's always back. back. Yeah, he's back like once a year, I guess, right? Yeah. Uh, but I'm surprised that he, because those songs that he played, it, it was, he has it all on his laptop anyway. Yeah, that was the other thing I found. I was like, kind of thinking to myself that too much of it was on the laptop. Yeah. Or how much of this is on the laptop, or what is he even doing? Because. But how can he turn that off if he have, has? So it's already pre-programmed in there, like every sound that he does. Oh, maybe. I don't know. Because he'll that... play that exact same song and have it sound exactly similar. like that. Yeah. But then. Unless it's pre-recorded loops, because some songs he'll actually start start by building the loop to it, right. and then he plays off of that and gets into the song. I could see him having a, like you say, a backup, where he can just mute a bunch of tracks when he has the parts, or, yeah. or unmute them in the occasion where shit goes south, like the other day. Uh, and then, may, But maybe also a lot of it is, is there, but he's augmenting it, right? So like yeah. a lot of people will do that, where they'll have, they'll still have the basic stuff there in case, or or because it just makes it so much beefier too, right? Yeah. And I yeah. find that's an interesting kind of trick, like you uh, you can't tell what he's doing, what he's not doing, because yeah. all those layers are there. Like when he was doing the the throat stuff, yeah. Um, the whole time, I assumed what I was hearing was all coming from that. But then at one point, you know, it didn't happen, and I was like, oh, I actually quite this. Thanks, man. Thank you. You want a coffee, too? Always, yeah. Okay. Thank and you. And do you like some jam for the kids? Uh, peanut butter? Uh, Will you have peanut butter? Uh, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, and you, you realize, like, oh, this... Every time they do this movement, I hear this sound, I assume they're making it, but actually it's all... And some of it's on tape as like a just right. as an augmented kind of thing. Oh, you got me. You fooled me. Yeah. <laughs> Tricked me. Yeah, but I mean that's that's the entire industry these days, man. Yeah. Yeah. It's like um. What do you need? Um. Thanks, man. There's this guy. <coughs> uh, like lately, I've been listening to a lot of like this stuff called the uh, cyberwave or synthwave, and it sounds like '90s 
synth Mortal Kombat tie yeah, yeah, yeah. And I went to one the other night called uh, Carpenter Brute. Oh, it was Carpenter Brute, they're okay. called. Yeah. And it was a drummer, a guy uh, with a couple keyboards, and then like a metal looking guitar player. And it was like, it was really interesting. Um, it was like pretty much like what a DJ set would be, what it sounded like. Right. But it was a live band playing. Um, like a tempo? Yeah. Like the dancey sort of. But it was a live band and this guitar player like total headbanging and stuff with his long hair. And, you know. and then there's this other guy coming uh, next weekend. His name is Ghost. G O S T. Yeah. And I've seen, I'm like, okay, well, I'm not really big into him, um, but I, you know, a lot of that stuff is similar. So I, you know, so kind of stuff is it same thing, same like cyberwave type thing. Is, um, are they using real instruments, or is it all? But uh, then I Hamilton kind of shit. Or here's the thing, though. So then I saw footage of this guy, and he wears this. Um, Skull face, yeah. And a lot of the times he's just kind of dancing on stage, Brutal. and he's got his laptop and maybe a little keyboard thing, and that's it. But like he'll start playing something and then just play it a bit and then let go and then just walk around on stage like freaking out and head banging and I'm like. Eh. Right. I don't really need to go see a guy who press some buttons and then dance. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently that's what Tiesto does. That's what the entire EDM community does. Except for, uh, except for Denmo. Yeah. Well, I mean, even even he will admit that that's primarily what he's doing. Oh. No. It's really hard to... I thought he said, like, in his master class, he's like, you don't want to be that guy, but... Yeah, but... The thing is, like, the bigger the production gets the more reliable it needs to be and you know if you're gonna bring out a hundred thousand dollars worth of production a cost of production every day yeah. or whatever yeah. you know you want your set needs to be super also there's 40,000 people there you've got 12 people who are making this show happen every night it's not yeah. just the DJ you can't just like have your laptop crash or have one of your 12 analog synths not work or yeah whatever you kind of need to which is interesting like people bands go out and play the same set every day basically yeah unless you're like bruce springsteen and you're calling and calling the songs every like there's no set list basically but yeah or but still, Jam does that too. Yeah, but you know, most of these bands they go out, and and again, the reason is because it's like you're building a production from start to finish. You want to have an arc for the night. You don't want to come out and play like a ballad first, and you don't want to you you, you, you want to kind of work on like a, an energy and a whole show. And now DJs are doing that too, but because DJs aren't like struggling to play their instrument or whatever it, now they're getting flack for not doing anything but it's like really you're not there to have someone be performing necessarily anyways like that that's what DJs are it's just they're playing right. music I don't know what yep. do you expect yep. well it's like well people will go to see a Snoop Dogg DJ, DJ said and he just kind of plays records yeah. and stands on the stage and smokes weed yeah. yeah, and that's it. A buddy of mine went to see him in uh, Seattle and he said it was so odd. It was just him standing on stage for two hours smoking weed, playing, playing records, yeah. hanging out yeah. and people stood there and just like stared at him Yeah, like it was a show. Super weird, right? Yeah. Yeah, but as long as people keep turning up, it's gonna keep happening, right? Mm -hmm. There's big money in that too. Oh, yeah. To be like, oh, I went to a party and so and so was there. So you're yeah. seeing, you're seeing a lot of rap bands nowadays. So they're bringing a live set. Yeah, yeah. And I, from what I've heard, it sounds better. When they got a live band with them. It's like they got more control over everything. 
Oh, it's great. Yeah. It's, well, there's more energy, I think, if you have a really solid live band. Oh, yeah. You know, everything. Yeah. It's more energy. Yep. Also, because it's like all of this stuff is happening on stage instead of one guy one walking guy. back and forth for 90 minutes or whatever, right? Yeah. Oh, exactly. But again, when you get into that, you can only play the songs that the band knows. Yeah. And has the samples for and whatever. Whereas, like, I think something that really benefits the DJ community is. As soon as a new song drops, they can start using it, yeah. like working it into their set. Or as soon as they, you know, produced a new song, like it doesn't even need to be released yet, they can start doing it. But a band on the road is not gonna like. Sometimes they do bring new music out that they've been working on or whatever. But a band on the road is not gonna like write a song and play it live, like all within two weeks or something oh, like that, yeah. right? Or yeah. Uh, yeah, or, well, yeah, their, their set list is not going to change for an entire album cycle, even, for, yeah. you know, uh, a year and a half or, or whatever, you're, you're not going to hear any new music from this artist, uh, or maybe at the end of the album cycle, you'll start to, if they come back, you might hear one or two new songs or some back catalog stuff, but... DJ whoever can be adding songs to their catalog like every 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 day. Oh yeah, exactly. changing it up and adding new stuff. And you're saying it doesn't kind of in a way cough them to you know a set list. You can keep and grow on the road. Yeah, and continue to. Well, the thing, however, though, but then you got something like like. Uh, Nine Inch Nails. Yeah. When they had the big, huge production that they were doing, there was a section of the set where the idea was to have it completely different every night. Right. So because a lot of it's almost like Grateful Dead, but not to that extent. But people would go to multiple shows, so because they're like, oh, I hope they play. I wonder what they're gonna play. Yeah. So chase. But you don't like. Generally, I find those people like, oh, it's a different set every night. But then if you look like on setlist.com or whatever, you see it's the same section. It's like these song, these five songs happen, yeah. and then here's something that changes every night, and then maybe another of the same, and then a section that's like completely different every night. But with that, because their whole, that was like a huge production, and the, they had to, do you think that they pre-programmed all those songs? Oh, it's delicious. Thank you very much, man. Awesome. Yeah. Cheers. Do you think they pre-programmed all those songs that they had in rotation? Um, or was it like, okay, well, tonight we're going to play this, so... Well, it depends, but, I mean, he's not... Like, Trent's not like, well, I would assume, isn't waking up, walking into the venue for like a two o'clock sound check and being like, oh, we're going to play this song that some of you have never even heard before tonight. That would not be a great idea. Especially because also like the lighting guy, it's just, you're going to, in terms of the energy of the show, you're going to get to this, it's going to be just completely synced and locked, right? And then, like, I always think of it as between the band and the sound and the lighting the audience should feel like the whole room is this beast that they're in and the whole room is alive and reacting and as soon as you miss a lighting cue you know or the the band stops and like a second later the lights go out and the band starts again and a second later the lights come back on and it's not in sync anymore right whether the audience is like hyper aware of that or not subliminally i think you start to feel that and if it happens for five or ten minutes where just the lighting guy has no idea what's going on yeah. and the band has no idea what's going on and everyone's looking at each other for cues and waiting for Trent to finally like drop his hand and start a song that they all know the energy of the set can really go to shit in a hurry and then you spend the next two songs trying to get that back you know yeah. with the audience yeah. so probably the open sections are like he's like okay I'm gonna launch this synth thing and we'll jam out on it and see where it goes and then when you hear me launch this synth thing then you know like to peter down and whatever with uh, the lights and stuff yeah and with the band too musically right like uh, but they would still I would imagine would still work on that like they would jam that section with, yeah in rehearsal and, 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 and like and like sound checks and stuff they would play them yeah and uh, if it's a section where they're gonna play two of like a rolling list of six songs 
they have to rehearse all six of those songs. Like they, you know, they have to. And then have visuals pre-built for the. And that's the thing, yeah. The visuals for it, and yeah. So that's like, yeah, for a guy like Rob Sheridan doing all their visuals and stuff. Trent's like, yeah, we're gonna do twelve of these thirty songs, but you need to have the lighting and the visuals and all that stuff for all thirty songs. So it's it's not like the set list is changing as much as it's the song list is not changing. It's just you know they're pulling. It's, it's more like a thirty song set list, and but they only play twenty songs every night. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. When, when you go on long tours and then throughout your tour, say you hit a couple of really really big shows along the way like do you say bring say 30 songs on the road and then you see how everything reacts to them as they're going along yeah and then when you get to the big That's show true. go hey you know what they really responded well to this to yeah. this to this yeah let's build something around that and then bring does that happen or do you well, yeah, i've seen that too so it's that same nail store and i was watching the salads go and they were modifying the order of everything okay, yeah. at, at certain points because they're like, oh, this is, this flow isn't working. Yeah. It's sure. almost like a stand-up where they're like, oh, this joke is working, this one's not. And if I say it different this way, I get a bigger reaction. So that's yeah. what they were, what we're doing with their set list is like fine-tuning to see, yeah, you like know, what's the best opening song. Yeah, yeah. And then you know, at what point in the set do you want to slow it down, and how do you build it back up out of that? Yeah. And what's the best, you know, the biggest song to finish the night? But then you're still gonna have an encore. So what songs do you save for the encore? Yeah. yeah. And what's actually your last song? What's the last note you want to go out on, right? Yeah, and also probably you'll notice like when they do the the big markets like L.A. and New York or whatever, it'll be more of a hit parade. But then if the next day they do a kind of a B market like two hours away from L.A. where it's not going to be as many people, a lot of people will have been at the L.A. show. Then they'll do more. They'll throw in some B sides, and that that rotating section will be more like. Yeah, B-side songs or back catalog songs. Whereas in LA or New York, like that rolling section will still be songs that everybody knows. They just want to like hammer everyone to the yeah, home, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, depending on whatever. Yeah. I remember with. Uh, but there's also like parts where in the bigger markets, you almost want to pull because there's more might be more of a hardcore fan base they might be like oh we never played this song before live so let's bust it out in new york or something there is that uh but then it does still always come back to thinking about that before you even leave and i don't some bands will think about that but uh i mean when we were preparing for this recent tour it was like let's just put together a set list that is really good and works really well and and then call it a day, right? Because we have other shit to worry about. We were learning Ocean Machine for the entire tour too, so we didn't want to have to worry about this show every day because we had other things to worry about. Yeah. Uh, you know, had we been swapping and changing the set every night on top of, like, we spent our entire rehearsal at uh, uh, Soundcheck every day playing songs that we wouldn't play at the show, right? We wouldn't play until London. Oh, that's how you guys did it? Yeah, so we had like an hour sound check every day, and we would and play, play all Ocean Machine. Yeah, well, as much as we could. Like, it got to the point where we were doing like half of Rejoice, half of Failure, and then as much Ocean Machine as we could cram in, which is only about half an hour. Yeah. And then half of Rejoice just to like reset, and then that was it. But when you have an hour sound check, still you end up starting five minutes late because of something, and sometimes finishing five minutes early so I can go program lights for another you know, extra five minutes with a clear stage kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, we were basically every day rehearsing Ocean Machine for 40 minutes or half an hour. But then you had a full day to play it through or something I saw? Yeah, in Brighton we had the day off, off and uh, went to a studio and set up and just played. We only ended up playing it through twice, but that was the literally the only time we played the whole set, I think, all the way through. So. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, before that show, yeah. That's intense. Yeah. A lot of the songs, like, uh, 
Seventh Wave, Life, Night, Regulator, Funeral, Bastard, and Death of Music had all been played before at one point or another. Uh, so it was really like one of the, I think one of the bigger things, concerns was for Devin just singing it all because it's song after song of kind of difficult shit to sing. And then, uh, uh, conditioning his voice again to the, at the, uh, yeah, after it's eight weeks touring too, right? Oh, at I've been to the tour. tour. Yeah, yeah, it was the second last show, oh. 37th show. Yeah, it yeah. probably sounded closer <laughs> to the album because I remember I went back and listened to it, and his voice sounds like young and gruff. Yeah, compared to what he sounds like now, it's yeah. like different. Yeah, it's even night, do you listen to night on the album and night live? It's yeah. like. He sings it way more pretty. He's got so much more control now, yeah. right? And like, yeah, of his of his voice and his range and singing versus screaming and all that stuff. But also, when he was eighteen, he was eighteen, so yeah, he could get away with a lot more. And he wasn't screaming his bag off every night for forty days, thirty yeah. nights. Yeah, yeah. That worked though. There was a lot of ambient stuff on that album, too. Yeah, there was a lot of ambience, and actually one of the more, one of the parts we worked on a lot was sort of between Dev and I, uh, hide, at the end of Hide Nowhere, into Sister, into Voices, or 3 a.m., sorry, into Greetings, or Voices. There's just a lot of ambience and sort of triggering, like jumping around in the set to get to some sample that goes into another section or whatever. Okay. And uh, it was the most, sort of the most uh, raw and open we've been on stage in a sense as well. Like no click, just free and like actually, yeah, so that was really cool, but nerve wracking oh, because, course. yeah, because freedom. Because it could go fall off the track. Yeah, it can go very quick. wrong very quickly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it all worked out though. It's good. I remember when we did uh, the Z2 tour that you came out to the Canadian shows, right? Yeah. I don't know if you remember, but we were changing the set list a lot on that tour because we would, like, we opened with Z2 for a while. We opened with the, that saga. And it just was like weird and the audience wasn't super familiar with it yet and the band wasn't super familiar with it yet so yeah it didn't really go over that well um so a couple weeks into the tour or like a two weeks or even one week into the tour we swapped it for rejoice or something like that i think it was rejoice just and then we played it later in the set and there was some other songs where we sort of swapped out i think we even got rid of something like rain or something like that uh just because it was yeah oh secret science secret science is on the uh american tour you yeah that, that got cut yeah like everyone everyone apparently loved the song and wanted to hear it and we liked the song and playing it but live everyone was just like the thing the five. problem with it i wonder is, why they five it just was kind of a weird too yeah. no i think the problem with it was the order yeah it was in the wrong spot it was because uh, you're like i can't remember where it was but you came from something maybe like failure into Shift it or something yeah yeah, yeah. and then you're back into another gear and it's just this big lull in the step where it would have been really good maybe like right after it going to still toy goes home or something like Right. I can't remember, but I had this idea. I'm like, it would be perfect right here, but I can't remember the set offhand. But it's amazing how like this song placement makes such a difference. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. the same as when you're building the album too. It's like you yeah. know, you want the yeah. order to have a certain flow to it. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a blistering album, start to finish, where it's just, it just sounds all like one long song. Yeah. Even then, though, man, you can you can fuck it up pretty quick, right? By putting the wrong song second. But I wonder. That's a good question. If you take Rain and Blood and you change the order of those songs, would it make a big still, difference? I don't know. I bet you would. But it's hard because it's like it's so well known the order and everything. 
true. Yeah, once it's ingrained in your head, it's, so hard, it's hard to, to you can't see it objectively, right? Yeah. That's an interesting point. Yeah. I think you can still make an argument for that, though, even though everyone already knows it. Maybe you could, uh, well, you could find a lot of people who don't know it, too. Like this guy. Hey. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, try a different order. So every song is the same oh, speed and just like, Wah. Yeah. Right. Basically, you just find, uh, like, so you know a lot of bands that go on and they'll play an album in its entirety. Yeah. And see if they play it in the same order they do on the album or if they play it in a different order and then see if there's a difference. Yeah. See how much of the audience even notices. Yeah. I don't know if you, it would be. The clutch That's what I all thought. The time. When I saw the Ocean Machine set list, I thought Regulator, I always remembered Regulator being early in the set. We always play it like second in the set or something. Or on, yeah, I always remember it being early in the album. But maybe it's because I would skip that whole ambient that. middle part right. and just get to get like, right to the good. I'm like, I just like hit skip on my CD player. Skip through 3 a.m. and sister and stuff just to get straight to regulator. <laughs> it's a pretty long amount of yeah downtime in the middle of that record, I guess. Yeah. But yeah, the regulars still after greetings and voices, which are pretty rock tunes. Yeah. Wow. Did you guys bring visual uh, visuals to that set too? Yeah, that all got done in the last. Uh, week or something. <laughs> I actually programmed, I did all the programming for it. Thank you, man. Like, uh, the night before. Always, yeah. Yeah, programming was done pretty last minute. But it worked, and I guess I knew what I was doing, so it worked. But yeah, uh, this guy, Tim, who's done a bunch of stuff for us before, and is awesome, uh, also did it very quickly. Hey man, we need some realistic ocean scene. It was all like uh, four of the same shot of the ocean, so it looked like we were on the ocean, I guess. Yep. Uh, and there was like a, a bleak, like kind of like this weather without rain and then with rain, and then a uh, sunny one and a uh, nighttime one. Okay. And it was just fading between them. But it was nice how subtle it was. It was nice. It was, it was kind of like just like having a backdrop yeah. that, but it you know the the weather changed. Yeah. It, it was really cool. To finally, do that. I, I've been wanting to do something like that for years, where you have visual, like you use the fact that we have the uh, a capability to do visuals, right? Um, but not just have it be like music videos, yeah, or like yeah. Ziltoy doing the can can on screen or whatever. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was cool to finally do something more like environmental or textural or whatever. For sure, yeah. yeah it was yeah. really cool. I think it worked out really well, too. Thank you, man. Yeah, that was cool. How did you figure out the white stage? What do you mean? Well, it was Dev's brainchild with the white stage. White stage? Yeah, yeah, we kind of. They stole the idea Faith No More from, yet. from Zim. <laughs> slash Faith No More. <laughs> slash yeah. Faith I no stole more, the yeah. idea from Faith No More to use it for my stupid grind band show. And then the Devin stole it from me. Yeah. yeah, it was awesome. Because we saw Faith No More that year at yeah. Bumbershoot. That's right. And then, and then I went back to Scotty, the drummer for Emo, and, and Mike stole my idea. And I said, no, no. And then I went to Scotty. I'm like, we should do a completely white stage, like Faith No More, and put flowers up and everything, and like make, and we all have to wear white and all this, because it's not expected for like a grind band to yeah. like yeah. be like that. And pretty, and to do at the end of it, it wasn't pretty though. It was like, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, we had because we had like yeah. the screen drop in the front, um, and then a floating Wizard of Oz Devon head came up and right. was like yeah. talking to people for six Talk minutes, and it was way too long, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and then at that time, we sprayed the whole set down with paint. And then the curtain dropped, and it was just like chaos, and it looked like a Jackson Pollock painting, Sweet. but a whole stage of it. I heard once that uh, Jackson Pollock paintings are more random than 
when a compute when an algorithm makes a random mutation. Really? Some weird like that. I'll have to look that yeah, one. Yeah. Find a reference for that one to put in the link of this podcast. <laughs> but uh, yeah, super strange. Or it was like maybe maybe it wasn't a computer algorithm. Certainly that would be the most random. But uh, but you're making a mathematical equation to make something that has no to be random. Yeah. It might have been more like when people try to make things random. It's not as random as a Jackson Pollock painting. So it was, it was still the human connection. So I actually, but I he didn't happened. like all of you was you just flicking. I don't know. Was he flicking? How much thought? Like like where and when he flicked though, and how much he flicked. <laughs> Maybe he was flicking blindfold. I have no idea. And you know that that child sold some painting as a Jackson Pollock or something. Right? Really? Yeah, some kid was like. I thought I thought it was then his dad. They found out his dad was actually doing it. Or is that another? Oh story? yeah, maybe that's what it was. Yeah, some kid. Did you hear about that one? No, I didn't. Know. It was this kid uh, who was like this painting protege, and they were because he was so young and his paintings were like Jackson Pollocky. I think so. There was something like they were, they were obscure of some sort of abstract. Yeah, because yeah, they weren't, it wasn't like amazing. But it didn't look like a kid's painting either. Yeah. Right. Like the square house with the triangle Little and stick happy men. sun in the corner. The happy sun. <laughs> yeah. The Teletubby sun. Um, but the, yeah, and these paintings were like being sold for a lot of money. And then it got found out that his dad was actually doing it and saying that his kid was. Oh wow! So then that bastard. So then a lot of people had this bullshit paintings in yeah. their house that they paid too much for. Sucker! Yeah. <laughs> things happen. It's like anything of like artwork. I'd rather just like make something and give it to someone. Or make it myself to put up on the wall. Yeah, okay. Instead would, of go out and you pay like a oh, bazillion yeah. bucks for. Right, but I would be happy to sell my piece of shit art for $10 million. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah if you got offered uh, that kind of money, of course. Yeah, I'll, I'll draw you a blue line on a 30 foot canvas. But you have to have a name for yourself first. Then anything you put to canvas is just amazing. Yeah. Once you have that name, it's like, yeah. oh. Well, it's, that's the, yeah, there's a, there's a really great rant by some dude on Facebook or YouTube or something where he's just going off about modern art, contemporary oh, yeah. art, whatever. He's just like, what the fuck is this? Like, yeah. You know, it's only, it's only good because people who have, you know, spent a bunch of time learning what's good tell you it's good. That's right. The average person has no idea why it's good and doesn't see any value in it at all. It's the praise. All these other people are, yeah. Oh. All these other people are telling you it's good, but why? Yeah. This is why I always wanted to, and I still want to partner with like a curator or someone, because in my mind, it's not what you do that makes it good. It's the person explaining why it's good that makes it good. And I understand, obviously, like the artist most of the time does have that in mind when they're doing it, and they explain that to the curator, and obviously, or whatever. Somehow, that information is there to be picked up, and it is brilliant in however way that it's brilliant. But at the same rate, sometimes it's like a cup on a table, and it's not the fact that it's been done; it's, it's how you appraise it, or how you yeah. describe it, that makes it so value. Yeah. But then the value is not in the artist's. And the values in the curator's hand. That's right. Which I, I think that no, I think that I, I agree with that because like I had that one uh, art show at the yep. that Down. dance club there downtown yep. when I first moved here, and I photos. had no huh? the photos. Yeah. No monsters. the old three o the three o four or whatever it was called on Seymour. No, three o six or three o four. Oh yeah. It's like a okay. club now. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, people will come. Like I, had, I don't know. People will come up and say, "Oh, what, what's the meaning behind all this? What are you trying to say?" I'm like, I don't know. It just kind of looks cool. Yeah. I, yeah. I had this idea, and I was like, I did it. Yeah. And and basically, the idea was I wanted to put up a whole wall, like a, like a crime scene. Um, 
war room, like a detectives when they when they take all the photos of from the crime scene, they put it up and they try to like map out who the killer was. So I'm like, I'm gonna do that, but with like just photos, and the, all the photos were of that and that sort of crime scene looking type of thing. That's kind of cool. And a bit snuff, like, and I'd sold them all for ten bucks, and I had a big tacky uh, exclamation mark of like ten bucks, and people were buying them for ten bucks, and there's like walking around, and there's there's awesome. people having pictures that size of postcards, yeah. they're like thirty bucks for a you know right. photo on a postcard, and I had eleven by seventeen posters, which cost me forty cents each to print, I'm like ten bucks. <laughs> So it was like, yeah. and you know, and it's like, yeah, more people were buying it. Um, but a lot of other people, like the real artists there, were kind of upset at what I was doing because well, I had no deep. intention. I had no, I what I didn't, I didn't have a message. I didn't, you know, and I was ten bucks and everybody, you know. But I wonder though, if you were to say ten thousand. Then with the higher ends, be all like, "Oh, look at this! That's it! Yeah, this, exactly. look at this! This is real art here because it's got a ten thousand dollar value on yeah. it, as opposed to ten dollars. Because then by you putting ten dollars, maybe they think it's devaluing their stuff. Because your stuff looks just as good as theirs, and you say ten bucks, and they're trying to say however much it costs." I guess it's like wine. Yeah. If you pay the hundred bucks for a bottle of wine, you think it's so awesome because you paid a hundred bucks for it. Yeah. But you just like buy whatever is delicious, which sometimes is an eight dollar bottle of wine. Hey, hey, wine, is wine, I guess. Wine <laughs> is wine. I heard that uh, even even for like sommeliers or or people who really know their wine, if they know that a bottle is more expensive, it will taste better. Mm. So it doesn't. What? Yeah, like the price. The, the knowing the price is more will affect how oh. you experience it. Oh, even okay. if you're like, like a, even if you're an amazing wine taster and you know like what's better or worse. I mean, obviously, shit wine is still going to be shit wine and good wine. But I guess if you have the same wine or two very similar wines, and you're told that one's ten bucks and one's a hundred bucks, you're gonna think that the hundred dollar one tastes better yeah. in, because of the money, in a sense. But I guess still you might not like it as much. I don't know. Yeah. When, well, when we were in Portland, I bought a glass of bourbon at that. Uh, whiskey library. Oh yeah. And I think it paid forty bucks American for it. Yeah. Because I thought, oh, I got it, you know, do it nice here in this nice place. And it was so bad. Really? Yeah, it was really bad. Why? Do you know? I your finished whiskey, it, but I was like, yeah, this is gross. Do you know your whiskey? Or like? It was bourbon. I know bourbon. You know your bourbon. So you knew. It was bad. I wanted to try something that I never tried before, and there was this company I never heard of. And then they told me all about it, like the person at the bar. And, huh. Yeah, and it was just, I'm like, cool, I'll get that one, but it was just weird. I wonder if it was not kept well or something. No, it was just gross. It's weird. Because I think what they did is they took short ends of barrels that other companies couldn't sell. And like they can't put it in their line, so it's like they have all this leftover. So then they buy that up for cheap, and then they kind of mix their own concoction of all these other higher end, and they sell it at a cheaper cost. So it was like it was all it was like a thirty year old bourbon too, but thirty because all the mixtures were all like thirty year old casks. Yeah. And stuff. yeah, mix in a bunch of really good stuff. Doesn't necessarily make no, really no, good stuff. not at all. It's very easily made. No. What time is it? I don't know. 12:30.
Yeah. What's up this afternoon? I have to work at 2.30. Uh, you have to work at 2.30. Did you drive here? Can I give me a lift in? Yeah. Yeah. You just want a lift too? I drove too. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> what is up this app? Got to hit up to the drugstore give me some razors. Yeah. Razors. Time to shave. Yeah. Have you ever thought about the Dollar Shave Club? I uh, know because once I don't have to shave, I'll grow the beard back. Uh, why do you have to <laughs> shave? So now you're getting oh, like, gonna work. I have to wear a oh, shit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. That makes sense. I was wondering why you were looking so uh, short there. Sure, yeah. <laughs> ah. That's the thing about the subscription stuff. It's like you know that you're locked in. Yeah. Well, so you unlock, I guess. I guess. Because but, but, yeah. there's some MeUndies. Yeah. Is like a subscription, so every month you pay twenty bucks a month, and they send you underwear. Every month. I know, but how, who needs that much underwear? That's a lot. Right? Oh, a lot so of so Twelve new pairs a year. So it, they, it's a subscription for underwear. Yeah. So you pay twenty bucks a month, and each month they send you a pair of underwear. One pair? Yeah. I got one pair. It's actually really good. Apparently they're really good, but but is it really good or is it just new underwear? No, it's like yeah, that's like good microfiber point. or something. Whatever they. The fiber's different. It's micro. It's like, it's like bamboo or? It'd be like those, um... That's the other thing. If I'm going to sign up for something like that, I want it to be like bamboo or oh, eco-friendly. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it better be the best pair of underwear. It better want. be the best pair of underwear, yeah. Apparently yeah. they are. Also, they use sex to sell their products, so I don't know, man. I don't know. But it's underwear. Well, isn't that convenient? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, That's a so, great idea for your cards. Yeah, man, except it's always too small. It's always one card too thin. You know? Oh, this might keep getting cracked and broke my cards. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I think I took your fortune cookie. How do you know? Because it was right here. Oh, that's fine. It was now we're all taking, to you. Now we're all taking different uh, fortunes. You will be inspired to new heights of accomplishment. Ooh. Ah, yeah, they're all... Uh, yeah. Imagine if one was just so totally negative and... Yeah. Cheers, man. Thank you very much. Your self-restraint will play dividends. Ah, oh, well, sure. what are you restraining from? <laughs> Drink. What if you open it up? Drinking, yeah, that, no doubt. You will get cancer and die very shortly. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Something random like that. <laughs> yeah. Or help, they won't let me leave. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you got the two. The double. You got a bunch. Oh. There's more than two Ooh. in there. A companion is an added strength. You will discover your hidden talent. No. You guys aren't eating your fortunes though. Oh, uh, I didn't believe in that fortune, so. Oh, well, is that you how have it works? It and then by eating it, it solidifies it. Really? I just like the deep fried goo. It's really good. Yeah. Maybe my favorite part of this meal. Pretty good though, good food. Oh, let's get the Benny next time. I think corned beef hash is like my Achilles heel when it comes to breakfast. It's so good. Or like anything with pulled pork. Yeah. Oh, really good pulled pork. Yeah, hard to beat, man. Well, shall we? we? Alright, so there it is. Boyos, it's um. Yeah, I don't know what to call this thing. I just know I want to do more of these because I'm selfish and I want to have interesting conversations with people. Um, and I also found that the act of actually recording it sort of enhances the quality of the conversation. It's kind of hard to explain, but you're not as... Uh, distracted by your phone or anything. You're more engaged in the people you're sitting around with and you're listening to them more intently and you are uh, 
your contributing uh, input into the conversation a little bit more thoughtfully because it's like the act of the conversation is the art form is the is the medium of creating something um I don't know if that makes any sense or it's just sort of foo-foo art mumbo-jumbo. I'll try to get some more of these out. If anyone does ever listen to this, which I actually don't even care if people listen to it or not, um, you know, uh, I guess drop me a line in wherever you are listening to this and seeing it. You can find my information online somewhere. Uh, Yeah, I just... Give me some thoughts on what to call it, because I don't know what to call this thing. Kind of thought, like, Zim Zimmy talks stuff to people. Zim Zimmy says words to people. Mm. Zim Zimmy doesn't care about you, just cares about himself and talk another I don't know okay I'm done